So, thanks so much, Jason. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, your background, your story? Sure. Um, I'm 49. I've been working for Donald Trump for about 20 years. I live in Teaneck, New Jersey. I have six children, an amazing wife, and uh, I've been fortunate over the last month to have been tapped by Donald to be his, one of his two top Israel advisors, which is a very unique and special opportunity to me. Amazing. So you were in the coffee business, is that, do I have that right? Or? So after law school, I started working for a large law firm. And uh, it was a great firm, great experience, but wasn't really what I was looking to do. I had a little bit of an entrepreneurial side to me. This was a time before those pod machines existed, the, the type that people now have in their own kitchens. And there was a company out of Italy that was marketing this pod machine for industrial use. So I invested in a few machines, and after work hours, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, I would go and try to collect accounts. And I was very lucky to be able to place these machines in high traffic areas. I had a whole bunch of stores in Penn Station. I had a few airport locations, including what doesn't exist anymore, the Tower Air location. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of very high traffic areas in and around uh, the 8th Avenue strip, where they have a lot of these donut shops and the like. And it was exciting. It was very hard. Uh, there were times when I was busy at work and my wife, who was in medical school, used to have to go to the airport with my tool belt. And they would look at her and say, what are you here for? And she would say, I'm the cappuccino lady. <laughs> so she would open up the machine and try to fix it. In the end, it didn't work out because of two reasons. One, and this is a, a tip that I would say is very important for entrepreneurs out there. The two lessons that I learned is know who your competition is. I did not foresee Starbucks making the inroads that they did. And just as I was building, they started opening up stores in the city, which of course was followed by other companies, some of whom don't exist, like New World Coffee, I think, was one of them. But they were all over the place, and that helped weaken the business. And the other point I would make is knowing who you're getting into business with. So this Italian company may have been talented in making a good machine, the problem was the work ethic in Europe was vastly different than the work ethic we Americans are used to, right. at least back then. This sure. was back about 22, 23 years ago. So there were times if, uh, let's say, distinctly remember, Tower Air was notorious for not planning in advance. So they would call me at 9 o'clock at night and say, we're out of capsules, we have a flight going to Israel, we need 1,000 capsules tonight. And that's real mo that was real money to me as a newlywed and as a young person. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I would think nothing of jumping in the car with 1,000 capsules. I would take 2,000 to try to get them to buy and plan ahead, and they wouldn't. <laughs> but there were times when they needed things, and I couldn't get the support from the company in Europe. I would call over, and they would say things like, oh, this is August, call me back in a month, because they were on vacation. Right. So right. those are the two takeaways from that story. But the coffee business ended up dovetailing into my job at Trump. I was working, I, by that time I had switched firms. I was trying to finance the coffee company by continuing to practice law. And uh, I think that entrepreneurship edge on my resume set me apart from some of the other lawyers who were applying for the job. Very nice, very nice. And Tower Air is out of business today as we know. Yes. So when you're doing business with a company, can you draw on that and say to yourselves, you know what, they're not planning ahead, they're going outside their sweet spot, this is not what they do, and use your sort of acumen that you've learned from that coffee business, or do you just sort of just try and give everyone a shot and, and uh, you know, hope for the best? I think it's probably a mistake to give everyone sh a shot and hope for the best, because then you're wasting, you're spinning your wheels for nothing. So then I was very hungry, really was trying to make a success at it and followed that formula of trying to give everybody a chance. They were a good client, but they, I spent so much time dealing with them as a client that in the end it wasn't worth it at all. And, and it wasn't Tower Air, by the way, it was the food service uh, vendor in Tower uh -huh. Air. But I think that it's really another takeaway, it's a point that you're raising, which I think is a great one, is only work with people that can work to your speed, to your efficiency. They not only need to be trustworthy and be able to make your money, but they, you need to be able to handle the request efficiently, efficiently and not twist, your, uh, not twist yourself into a pretzel and waste your time. Yeah. So you've been at the Trump Organization for? Almost two decades. Two decades, wow. And you started in what position? 
I started in the assistant general counsel position. That's pretty high spot. This, it sounds very hush of. Well, we were, it was one of two people at oh, the okay. time. And uh, I had come out of a, a really great law firm. So I was already a third year lawyer. So being an assistant GC, while a good position, I wouldn't say it's a hush of position. It's a good position. OK. Good. And what would be some of the things that you can share with us that you've learned in terms of negotiation? I know you speak on negotiation, mediation, sales, motivation that you can't read in a book, that you can't get out of a, you know, in a course or from a, a lecture. What's things that you just learn being on the front lines? Probably one of the best tips I could give is watching everybody in the room all the time and learn the good and discard the bad. So when I watch Donald or even his children, they're all really great negotiators. Each time I see them, there are so many things that I pick up and try to incorporate into my wheelhouse. Many of my colleagues are skilled. Sometimes I'll watch one or two that, you know, perhaps do things differently than I would. And I think to myself, is that a method I would like to use or is that a method that isn't suited to my personality? Uh, sometimes I'll watch people on the other side. There's one person, he's a great lawyer, a very smart guy, but he tends to negotiate very, very tough. And I had worked alongside of him in my prior job and I would just really cringe at the way he would speak in the midst of a negotiation. And I had the good fortune of negotiating opposite once when I was at Trump and he was on the other side. And it was very funny because I knew his tricks of the trade. So he would get very red faced and pound on the table and be really, really tough. And I would sit there and I wouldn't let it phase me because I knew who he was. Right, right. So in deep down, he's a great guy. That's just his charade. But I guess the first tip is really learn from the people around you and improve yourself constantly. The second tip I find that people probably make a big mistake in doing is not trying to understand the other side's needs. You may have a great story. You may have a great, a great wish list. You may know exactly why you need to do something. But the other side has the same thing. It doesn't mean that you should, um, for, you should enforce your way on them. And it doesn't mean you should just uh, take everything that they want to take uh, take everything they want to grab from you, but in order to make a good deal, you have to listen carefully, try to address their needs while not giving up your important points. I find that people very often go into a negotiation and don't listen to the other side, and that leads either to a failed negotiation or once a deal is set, the deal doesn't stick because the other side realizes that they didn't get what they wanted out of a deal. Right, right. In negotiation, there's so many different strategies, tools, and tips, and techniques people have. And you know, some people say start very high and then you'll negotiate down, or no, start with what you honestly need. What would you say is the been entering a negotiation, whether with um, a real estate transaction or for a property or for just to, to buy something? What would be the mindset you should have when you go in in terms of? You know, the best tactic, should you start off very, very high? Should you start off from a position of strength? Should you come in very conciliatory? What's the best approach walking into it? It's a little hard to answer that question. I've seen people be effective at both. I've seen people start really high and they don't anger or upset the other side and they come to a happy medium. But I also see plenty of people get angry if people start out and walk away. Right. So to give you an example, there was once a deal where somebody was going to use our brand and they were expected to have an exclusivity within a small radius around the particular area that they were doing business in. But for whatever reason, they came back and in their document, I don't know if it was the business people or their lawyer, one of them thought they were being geniuses, and they grabbed or wrote out a gigantic exclusive area. And what that resulted in is, as I was reading it, I emailed uh, one of the Trump family members who was on the deal, and we were both so upset by their uh, thinking that we aren't reading the documents or by the chutzpah, if you will, of them right. asking for that. We called them up and said, we're not interested in doing the deal. We put the contract down. Eventually, you know, they came around and realized it was a tactical error on their part. They apologized and the deal got done, but it really set the entire transaction back by a lot because they were just uh, unpleasant to deal with at the beginning. Right. And are there some people who you'll say, wow, this deal makes sense. I'll earn some money. It, on paper, this is right. But this is not someone who I want to do business with. Would you ever do that? No, I think who you do business with is so critical because you could have the best deal in the world economically. You could have the Rolls Royce of contracts done by the best firm with every word that should be there. And at the end of the day, if the other side is not a person you want to do business with, either you don't get along or they have a different outlook as to what you have, 
they're dishonest. There's so many reasons why things could fall apart. The contract isn't going to matter. You're going to, you know, you will have lost time, you'll have lost money, you'll have a lot of aggravation. So one of the key things you need to look at is who your business partner is. Do you share the same goals? Do you share the same business philosophy? And uh, I, I agree, definitely look into that. Very good. Okay, now you may or may not be comfortable answering this, but what would you say or which mistake would you like to share with everyone that you would say was a mistake that you made you know, in business that you think, ah, you know what, that I sh I would, if I had to redo, I would do that one over again? Okay, I have a good one, and it's probably the first time I'm telling my side of the story. So. <laughs> uh, a good number of years ago, maybe when I was at the company about three years, so perhaps 17 years ago, at that point, my then boss, who was the general counsel, had been asking for raises for me. But that year, for whatever reason, he decided to let me go in on my own. At that point, I had not had a lot of interaction with Donald. And it took me a while to summon up the courage to go in. I was waiting for the right moment. By the way, this is my story. If you read his book, it's <laughs> a little different. Uh, so I summoned up the courage one day when I thought everything was, it was a good day, it was quiet. And I went into his office at the end of the day, which, first mistake, at the end of the day, people are tired. Maybe not the best time, even though then I was pretty young. I thought, oh, he's so quiet. It's a great time to go in. So I went in, and uh, I asked him if he had a few minutes, and his eyes narrowed. You know, he's so smart. And, and I, before I even walked in the room, he probably knew what I was doing. And uh, I asked him if we could talk about my compensation. And he was not happy to talk about it at the moment, and he was definitely very strong in terms of uh, how he handled the conversation. I would say that in 20 years he's been just such a great guy all the time. This is the one time that he and I had a little bit of a disconnect. So over 20 years that's not so bad. But I remember leaving the office thinking, oh, how am I going to get this accomplished? And it took, because he just flat out, no, I chose a terrible time. He describes it as he and I were together most of the day <laughs> and he, I knew it was a terrible day and you know, although I'm, he called me brilliant in the story, but he said, a brilliant guy. That part's true, right? Yeah. Well, that part's yeah. true, yes. Nice. <laughs> so, you know, how could I choose such a bad time to go in? But the, the end of the story, which also is not in his story, is it took me two and a half months to go back in, really, just because I didn't feel comfortable doing it. But I went in at the right time. I was working on a really big transaction, and we had a great conversation about the transaction, and then I, it just felt right this time. And I asked for it. And he was very receptive to it. And he asked me how much I wanted. And I asked for more money than I was going to ask for the first time. <laughs> and I got it. And it was simple. So always, I think the answer, the short answer to your question is choose the timing right. I didn't choose right. The first time was a big lesson to me. Huh. And it really is one of the most important parts, either in a negotiation or generally when doing business. And so it sounds like you have a genuine affection, admiration for him. Yes? I do. He's a remarkable man. Uh, he's been. A great boss is always polite to my family. He's so respectful of me being from just beyond uh, what I would expect out of somebody of his caliber. So I have enormous respect and hakarasa tov to him. So on that point, what is it like being from, and I'm assuming a largely non-from environment? It is a largely non-from environment. Uh, there are certainly you know a lot of Jews in the organization, but across the board, the company is respectful. The company is very much like a family. It's a huge company, but we're working for a family, you know, Donald and his three grown children who are active in the, in the company. And instead of being a nameless, faceless organization, you interact with real human beings who have hearts, who have, um, you know, they're really good people. And I've been very fortunate that working here as a firm person is a non-issue. Beautiful. You say it's a non-issue. Does he have, I'm assuming, a, a genuine appreciation for for Judaism, and it's when you've got to take off for yet another holiday, is he like, oh, you know, okay, okay? Or it's like, aye, 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 you know? No, I mean, I'm sure he feels it. If, when I disappear and things stop, right. uh, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't act uh, inappropriately or unhappy about it, but there's no question that he feels it. But I think your question is leading me to a very important point that I try to stress in the firm community, which is I need to be respectful of him and how he accommodates me in order for him to give the respect to me. So the one story that I frequently tell, I slept in the office multiple nights before a three-day untiff to try to tra get the transaction closed. Right. If I didn't do that, if I was very flip about it and right. you know, cut down my hours or didn't work long hours and just disappeared, I assume he would still be respectful, but not to the degree that he did. 
And one of the messages I tell young from people all the time is, when you have to leave on a Friday afternoon, if Shabbos is, let's say, as early as 409 in the sure. New York area, everybody has to do their own cheshbon of how long it's going to take to get there and padding it for traffic or train delays, you know, whatever each person thinks they need, that extra cushion of time. But don't leave at 1 o'clock in the afternoon if you could leave at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or even 2.30. Right. It's really inappropriate. It's not only unfair to your boss, but you sort of ruin it for all the front people. Right, right. So right. I think that people will be respectful to you if you're respectful to them. And I know lots of lawyers who go in, that's Motsi Shabbos, who work Sunday, who are you know, bending over backwards to show that they respect their employer for being respectful to them. I think more people need to focus on that. That's, and it's a Kiddush Hashem also. Is that, you know, it's not a one-sided thing. It's not, you can't just say, this is what I do, so live with it. By putting in that extra effort, time, and energy, you show that this is a two-way street. Right. I think we have to bend over backwards and double, double our efforts in order to be right. respected. So on that point, do you relate to the from employees differently than non-from employees? No, I think that what works out well in my organization is we each have respect for each other, not just on the religious side, but you know, let's say one person is a single parent, he has a child in daycare, I try to accommodate him. Uh, you know, uh, if there's a, a non-Jewish holiday that somebody wants to observe and if, th if there's a big deal going on, then I, I would expect that I would be the one or some of the Jewish uh, company personnel would be the ones to have to fill in right. because we expect them to work on you know, Sukkot, Pesach, Shabbos, whatever it is. Right. It's really, there's no science to it, but it's a question of each of us respecting each other's needs and f watching each other's backs. Very nice. What do you think would, is the biggest misconception people have about Donald Trump? I think the media does a very big disservice to Donald, and not just Donald, generally in the news, they've, do, they've done it to Israel, not all media, but plenty of media. I think what they do in order to garner ratings and sell ads is they take sound bites, they take a particular comment, and they turn those into stories which go far beyond what was actually said or what was actually meant, and then that becomes the news of the day. Right. So I think that what people should do generally about the news, certainly about Donald, but in particular is go beyond the one story, really understand what happened, perhaps watch the YouTube video, see things in context and really understand who Donald is or Israel is, whatever, you know, you pick your, your topic, but be deeper thinkers and be more thoughtful about the story because sometimes newspaper, newspaper stories or other stories that you hear are either biased, inaccurate, not deep enough. Mm -hmm. You also play a political role with the Trump Organization, yes? So I don't work on the campaign itself, but because he named me as one of these Israel advisors, it's become, uh, you know, I, I volunteer a lot of my time outside of work to uh, fulfill this role, and uh, it's definitely introduced me into the world of politics, which I had no experience with uh, probably four weeks ago. <laughs> wow, okay. And what is Donald Trump's... Uh, policy on Israel? Is, it, is that a fair question? or Yeah, it's a fair okay. question. So he's extremely supportive of Israel. I think he recognizes that Israel is a, Israel as a country shares the same values as the United States. It's a democracy. Everybody's treated fairly. Uh, f freedom of everything, you know, whatever person, type of person you are. And uh, it's a country that is in a very, very tough neighborhood. It has a lot of challenges. But he is an extreme supporter of Israel. He would like to guarantee Israel's security. And he is very outspoken about that. I don't know if you heard his APAC speech and the many references since the APAC speech. But I think his record is such that he's extremely supportive. At the same time, he is a deal maker. And he would love to see if he can make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. He recognizes it is a tremendous challenge, probably one of the most difficult negotiations in modern history. But as a deal maker, he sort of thirsts to do it. And I think a person like him, you know, with a person like him involved, there's a chance that it could happen. I think he sees his role as a facilitator. I don't think he would ever try to impose his views or our country's views on Israel or the Palestinians for that matter. I think that he rec as a businessman, he's very pragmatic and he recognizes that if you try to force two partners together and dictate what the piece is going to look like or what the transaction is in the business world, it's not going to stick. It sort of goes back to what I said before about the contracts. We could lay out a logical peace agreement, but if the parties don't agree to it, it's not going to stick. Right. So he would like to 
try to meet that challenge of helping the two sides get together. But at the end of the day, they have to be the ones to sit at the table. They have to be the ones to hash out the issues with his assistance. And, uh, you know, God willing, maybe he'll be able to accomplish it. Terrific. Are you open to some questions from our audience? Absolutely. Great. Okay. So if I can just ask whatever questions you have, if you can stand up and say the question loudly. As we're both approaching 50, we can't hear it so well unless there's a microphone. I would just ask, great, we have a microphone, that the question, uh, the scope of the question uh, be confined to our conversation and not um, an errant question that might take us too far off topic. Okay. If someone has a great idea, a great business pitch, but he's kind of a nobody, he's unknown, he's known to be unknown, uh, but someone who, who isn't, isn't of high color cannot, cannot um, produce whatever his, his issue is, how can he get the connection to get to people, who, people of means who can help him to take his, his idea to the next level? So uh, let me paraphrase it back to make sure I heard it correctly. Are you asking if you're not coming in with the Trump Organization name behind you and you're just starting out, how can you make those connections? How can you engage people at a higher level in order to grow your business? Right. Okay. <laughs> It uh, reminds me, I did an interview once in, uh, in Spanish, and it was on a radio, and they had a translator, and they asked me a question. I spoke for 10 minutes, and then she translated. It took about four seconds. I said, were you leaving anything out of that? Okay, so how would you say that you have somebody starting out in business, and they're, they don't know anyone, they have no connections, they have a great idea. What would be a good way to sort of network and to branch out, maybe in atypical ways? So I, I give the same advice to job seekers as well. There's nothing like networking. It's a lot of time. It's almost like a second job as well. You have to go out there and meet people. Uh, if I go back to my coffee company days, there was no substitute for me going out, stopping at each restaurant, introducing myself to the employees, to the manager, and that is how I ended up getting those accounts. Eventually I found, you know, let's say in Penn Station, the company that ran many of the concessions there, and I went you know, from one level to the next level to the next level. But you have to be patient. You need to be able to winnow who you're speaking to. There are a lot of people that are going to waste your time, so make sure that you're trying to be selective about who you're speaking to so that you're efficient waste with your time. But there really is no substitute, in my opinion, whatsoever to getting out there and just keep on moving and trying to meet people, networking, and describe what you're doing. And eventually, hopefully, you'll find the right people to help you propel yourself out there. Thank you. Can I do a follow-up on that? Because there are two parts of it. When, let's, for instance, when you um, sold your coffee, you had something tangible to show. This is coffee. You can select my coffee or someone else's coffee, or, or actually select if you want to sell coffee. But we're talking about an idea. So, so in my well, case, sorry, in my case, it wasn't just coffee. It was a new machine, this pod machine, that nobody was really using at the time. So coffee they already had, and they were using, most of them were using that you know, the, the glass carafe that sits on a heater uh, or the giant steel urn. In this case, what you're asking to the buyer was something completely new and much more expensive because each of those pods costs money. So you were indeed introducing them to a new idea. Now it's true, people drink coffee, so I wasn't creating, you know, uh, a new iPhone or think of any, you know, Uber, think of anything today that we use that didn't exist in people's imagination a long time ago. But at the same time, it was a new idea. If, it is, if you're lucky enough to have an idea that uh, in today's market, there are so many of them, I think you actually have an advantage because people, are, uh, people thirst for the next idea, in my opinion. When somebody told me about Uber a couple of years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and conceptually, since I don't take taxis, it didn't really dawn on me how effective a tool it is. But fast forward now to where I am today, I would say for the year when my oldest children, they're triplets, so uh, before they got their licenses, they just all got their licenses, I would say my Uber bills, because my wife works, were really large because she couldn't be everywhere at once for these older kids who had lots of places to go, and Uber is a tremendous tool. So if you have a new idea or a new concept, I think you'll find your audience if it really is a good idea. I should also say that if it is a, if it is a new idea, bounce it off a lot of people, do some targeting, because some people think the new idea is really the next best thing, and other people may tell you that you're on the wrong track. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. So, yeah. uh, my name is 
Hi, I'm Weiss Smith. Oh, yeah. I live in Israel. I think special for the expo. I have an invention. Okay. My name. Can I do speak into him? Yeah. My name is Chaim Weissman. I came from Israel. I'm an American, but I moved to Israel five years ago. And I have a beautiful invention. It cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to get it patented both here and in Israel. It's, I, I, since I haven't got uh, much time, I don't want to take up the audience's time, but I have a specific question for you. Uh, they can look up my invention on Google, and I will spell it very slowly. P like Peter, E like Edward, L like love, L like love again, E like Edward, H like house, P, uh, next word, plata, P like pet, uh, Peter, L like love, A like apple, T like Tom, T like Tom, E like Edward. That's my invention. It's called a Pella Plata. It's a terrific invention. I have it patented. I'm protected. I Sir, thousands of dollars to develop it. I have prototypes. I've, I've sold. I, I, please forgive me. I apologize. This is the least favorite part of this job here. It's just to maximize the opportunity we have. Would it be okay if maybe we set up a time to speak afterwards? Yes. Just to be able I to give it the time. I just want to know how deserves? to get it off the ground. That's okay. Uh, okay, son. So that's a very good question. Thank you so much. So let's say you've got an invention. You've, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread, and you've got it patented. It's protected. But there's so many people with so many great ideas so many lousy ideas. How do you get through the static? It's a difficult question because there are so many people. I, I'm not familiar. I don't want to mislead you and give you advice in an area that I'm not familiar with. So it's very tough for me to answer that question in, in, with a type of invention, with an invention. It's not, my, it's not in my wheelhouse. OK. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Yankee. And uh, the flip side, you were saying that it took you two and a half months to, um, to ask, muster up the, co the courage to ask for a raise. On the flip side, from an employer's point of view, how do you keep your um, employees happy um, as far as raises? That's question one. Question two, just question one for now. Great. How important On the flip is side. the work environment, uh, cultivating loyalty, praise, types of uh, incentives and motivations outside of actual financial compensation? I think those are all critical to keeping your employees happy. If you're underpaying them or not treating them with respect, not letting them feel vested, then you're going to have a lot of unhappy employees, which results in turnover, which is never good for the company, and increase because the company's bottom costs, which hurts the bottom line. I think you're going to find employees who are less motivated, which means they're going to be less productive. It doesn't mean you should pay over market, but you need to study the market, figure out what the right compensation is, what the right benefits are, make sure their hours are appropriate, make sure that they're allowed to grow and continue to climb in the company. One of the things that I love about Donald's style of, of management is that he will take any employee and let them propel themselves as far as they could go. So uh, to give you an example, the chief operating officer of the company started out as his bodyguard. And over the years, he impressed Donald with his skill set, with his tenaciousness, with everything that he wanted to do. And he kept learning and learning. And Donald eventually promoted him all the way up. Uh, another friend, colleague of mine, also started as a bodyguard and then became a project manager at a huge, uh, almost 1,300 room in, uh, project in Las Vegas. He managed the construction and now is one of the managers of the property. So if you're an employer, I would seek out opportunities to show your employees that they're not stuck in a particular role if they want to advance. And I think your employ those employees who want to advance, and many do, perhaps most, really would appreciate that, and that goes well beyond compensation. One of the things Donald Trump is known for is his loyalty to employees. As you just said, a number of people have been promoted. Uh, it sounds like you've got a lot of burly guys working there in upper management since they all started as body bodyguards. But how important is cultivating a sense of loyalty within a company? I think it's very important to him. I think it's very important to his family, uh, primarily probably because they're just good people, meaning it's, it's the nice thing to do. But the benefit of it to them is that they end up having upper management who have been with them for years. So we know what they need, therefore we can conduct ourselves in business just almost without speaking to them. You know, we know what, how their philosophy is, and it just, it's a win-win for everybody. We're happy because we get promoted. He's happy because he has loyal, uh, loyal fans, loyal employees. So I think it's very important to them. Nice. Okay. 
Okay, so you're saying it's not just the compensation, but it's also ma maximizing their skills and them and feeling good about themselves. Um, I work with my, my wife and I work together, and my brother-in-law, it's also a family business. How, any suggestions on how, how Donald does it with his family and working with them and business and pleasure kind of together, you know, that kind of uh, thing? Yeah, so working with family is one of the things, I mean, that, that, that fills half my day, is dealing with conflict with um, people who are forced to work with family members. And here it seems that Donald Trump cultivates that and enjoys having his family there. But you also have that sticky situation. There's nothing like family in business. How does he maintain, are there any sort of trade secrets that you can share, how he's able to allow for a positive work environment and you know, given the fact that you've got family members that are you know, uh, integral to the, to the entire functioning of the company? Sure. So family members, family businesses are very tricky. I think Donald has raised three just terrific kids. They get along well, they respect each other. I think they each recognize that each of them brings different talents to the table. There are overlaps, you know, they're all good at certain things together, others have different skill sets. And it's really important for the, the children, if you will, children, grandchildren, whoever the family members are, to respect each other, not to be competitive with each other. And what I see within our organization is that type of setup. I'm always amazed we could be in a meeting with all three of the kids and they all get a chance to air their views. They may not always agree, but they disagree respectfully. And eventually they come to the right, a consensus. Hopefully it's the right consensus. But they, if, if you're not getting along, you're going to have a lot of trouble. In this case, thankfully, they all get along. And that, to me, that's the key ingredient. Nice. Good morning. Uh, you, uh, I know you've said that you are a, an Israel advisor for Mr. Trump and not a political, not, not a business advisor. Uh, but I have a question regarding business and politics. Um, one of the things Mr. Trump's been criticized for is a lack of specifics in terms of his policy, being very general, you know, make America great again. It's a wonderful slogan. But in terms of specifics, how, what would you say would be the most important things that Mr. Trump would change in the business environment? So if in a Trump presidency in the first year, let's say, how would the business environment in this country change? How would it change things for businesses? Okay. I so appreciate the question, and just please forgive me, just because we want to limit the scope of the conversation to maximizing the opportunity we have to, to learn from Jason's business acumen, we're just going to shift back to that direction. But I appreciate the question very much. Yes. Jason, how do you advise young individuals who have graduated college and have an interest in real estate? Specifically, I have a son who just graduated uh, with a business degree and has dreams of becoming a developer. Where should he start? I think that networking is very important. Uh, I've taught two years uh, of real estate classes at Yeshiva University, and uh, one of the pieces of advice I give all my students is get out there. There are a lot of real estate networking events that are going on. We're fortunate to live in a city with a lot of development. Uh, even if you live in New Jersey, it doesn't matter. And there is no substitute for getting to know people, finding out the projects that are going on, and speak to all kinds of people. I'm not sure what specifically your child is interested in the real estate space and whether your child is interested, knows for sure now or wants to be exposed to a lot of areas. Uh, I would also highly recommend that they read up on every real estate deal that's going on, meaning take as many of the real estate periodicals and read up on deals, learn as much as they can, and then that will help sh both shape their interest in terms of what part of real estate they want to go into and hopefully get some business contacts and either end up working for a real estate firm or potentially partnering up with some people and creating their own real estate firm. I'm Benjamin Hoffman, uh, Superior Coffee Service. I'm a Keurig authorized distributor and I actually uh, appreciated what you said, you said before and I, the question to you is um, I'm up against a very serious competitor like WB Mason. Um, how do I beat that competitor, and especially in today's market, um, where there's fierce competition between Nespresso, um, other coffee types, uh, companies out there, and uh, that, that's a big challenge today. And also, I wanted, I, second question is, can you get me into the Trump organization? <laughs> okay. 
So when you've got competition, there's price, service, convenience. What should he be focusing on other than his own business and growing that? You know, is there a special formula here in terms of being able to one-up the competition? I think to me, service, because the price, the price should be more or less the same, meaning unless your right. coffee is so much better, in which case you could distinguish yourself on the coffee side, but I think your coffee is going to be very similar to the other coffee in those pots. So your price should be very similar. If it's not, it's going to be difficult for you to distinguish yourself. But you do need to distinguish yourself on service. I think people, especially in today's society, are so um, demanding, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they expect top-notch service, and if you're not giving them good service, you're going to have a very difficult time getting out there. So a follow-up question. Um, we, are, we are giving them service. We are, I'm an executive sales, and I do approach uh, a lot of business organizations, such as the Trump Organization. Um, the problem is I can't beat W.B. Mason's prices. They're giving away the coffee for free. I can't afford to give away the coffee for free. So that's a big challenge. Now, I can compete in some ways. Um, should I go into a different type of coffee, a Starbucks, an espresso? I mean, is that, you know, is that something I should change or stick to my line and try to just sell my coffee wherever I get my hands in? It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, it sounds like W.B. Mason is doing this as a lost leader, and it's very hard to fight a big company like that. A lot of internet companies, one in particular, uh, has done this with diapers and things like that. Very hard to fight that type of arrangement. I can't tell you whether you should distinguish yourself in terms of the quality of the coffee because I don't know the market anymore. It's you know been a long time since I've been in the business, but I would say from you know just guessing, knowing my CFO, he is less likely to want to pay a premium for the office coffee machine by getting more expensive pods. If the I, we don't use W B Mason as far as I know, but whatever it is that we use, if it's good enough, so in the coffee space in the in the office coffee space. Unless maybe you're, you know, Google and you're trying to really give your employees the, you know, the latest and greatest, I think you're going to have a hard time distinguishing yourself on higher coffee quality, but that's a guess on my part. Okay. Yes, please. I came here to ask you this question. Um, you are most likely going to be in a position very similar to Felix Frankfurter's position with President Roosevelt in the event that Donald Trump wins. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out so well for us this time. That time, hopefully with you, it'll work out much, much better. And I want to ask you about BDS, which is a huge issue. I'm not sure how much control the president will have, but I have two kids in college, and they're all over that issue. At the same time, we have an aggregator here, and I just read an article that there are 50 aggregators in Israel. Israel, the startup nation. Israel is where all these new ideas are coming from. On one hand, they want to divest. On the other hand, everyone wants to get into these aggregators. aggregators. They just changed the securities law. I'm a lawyer as well. My name is Robert Weiss. They just changed the securities law, 506C. You could look it up. They will now allow accredited investors, massive advertising to accredited investors. And that's what all the aggregators are doing right now. So my question to you is, do you believe it's a good idea for organizations like this, Jewish organizations, to try to capture this because there's a level of gullus here. Right now you have Intel, you have Microsoft, not necessarily Jewish companies, grabbing Jewish talent in Israel and then prohibiting Jewish investment on the other end. You want it or not? I'm not sure I follow the specific question. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I did either. If you could just crystallize it into one sentence, what would that be, please? In your new position, do you believe that it would be wise to stand up for Israel on the BDS pivoting off on the, on the um, startups and the aggregators in Israel? That's I think that is definitely one of the ways we could do it. Uh, look, as a father who has three kids who are touring colleges now, I am definitely concerned about the anti-Israel hate that is all over college campuses today with BDS. Uh, I penned a, B, a, a BDS article actually over the weekend together with some volunteers that I hope is going to be published in a major paper this week. It's unclear yet which paper will take it, but I hope it'll be there. It is definitely a challenge and I'm for any ideas that help undermine the BDS movement. I can't specifically say that your idea is a good one, but it sounds logical to me. 
Uh, I think we need to roll up our sleeves and help Israel, in particular with BDS, every which way we can. Thank you. Next Thank question, you. please. Thank you. Naftali Berger, Digicore Technology Consulting. Um, as somebody that went through this and started up a business on their own, what advice can you offer to young startups or even regular entrepreneurs on how to balance the work and family life? It's a great question. It's a challenge, frankly, that even at 20 years out in, or 24 years out of my career, uh, my wife has the same challenge. I think I'm, I subscribe to the theory of what I call work-life integration, not work-life balance, which means that you can't necessarily say this is work and then you shut down and this is home. If I have to respond to emails at night, which I always do, I'm going to come home. I'll try to get home at a reasonable hour, whatever I can. I couldn't necessarily do that at the beginning of my career. I'm fortunate this many years out I could have a little bit more control over it but I make sure to keep the phone off. And it's very tempting, right? It's so easy to just take it out of the pocket. It's very natural for us to just keep checking email. It's become a psychological phenomenon. But just force yourself to keep your hand off your phone unless you're expecting some emergency. Put it in a desk drawer, another room if you have to, if you can't, if you don't have that kind of self-control. Spend time with your kids, with your spouse. Do everything you need to do, and then get back to work. And I work late at night. I mean, I'm up 12, 1 o'clock in the morning responding to emails, working on articles. Uh, in particular now with respect to Israel, but I recognize that it's not, um, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, this is work and then this is home. I have to be able to accomplish both and I try to accomplish it very well. And I also don't look at, I don't look at it on a day-by-day -day basis. What I do typically is on Shabbos, I think to myself, did I do the right thing this week with respect to the company that I work for and the Trump family? Did I do the right thing with respect to my community? Did I do the right thing with respect to my family? More often than not, I'm, you know, I, I don't exactly think to myself I did the best, but I know I can look in the mirror and say I tried my hardest to do the best. And uh, it is a challenge, and it continues to be a challenge with uh, technology the way it is, with social media the way it is, it becomes, life becomes more demanding, We're, things outside the home become more demanding. Customers, bosses, whatever it is, everybody wants answers sooner and quicker and more thorough. And we just have to keep improving ourselves to integrate that life better and not ignore the things that are most important to us, which are our families, in my opinion. My name is Aaron Fink. I, have, I would like to know if there are maybe two ingredients that um, helped you stay within your company and to move up to where you are today, within the Trump Organization. And move up, what was the last couple of words? No, well, what would you say would be you know, your secret ingredient towards staying within the Trump Organization, moving up, staying wired into uh, everything that goes on there? I think the most important thing is loving what you do. If you're at a job and you think of it kind of as a ho-hum job, then you're probably in the wrong job, not necessarily the wrong career, but the wrong job in your career. To me, the secret ingredient is I just happen to love what I do. I love transactions. I love being a lawyer. I love the company that I work for. I love the family that I work for. So that energizes me. When I come to the office, I'm just excited. It may be a very difficult job. It's a very demanding job, tremendous amount of stress, but none of that, I don't view that as bad. I just view that as exciting. So to me, the secret ingredient probably has to be find a place that you will start your day and end your day feeling energized and excited by what you do for a living. Beautiful. Okay. Questions? <clears throat> right over here. Yeah. Uh, how many more questions are we... Okay, one will take one more question, then we'll go ahead and wrap it up, okay? okay. Yes, please. The last question. Hi, right, thank you for coming. My question is like that. They say in the community of uh, property investments that uh, it's saturated basically and it's in the high peak. What do you think about that? Is that so? Or there's still opportunity? And I'm sorry, forgive me please. I, I couldn't hear the question so well. Could you ask you to rephrase it? Real estate property investments. Uh, you're saying the prices are just going they, through the roof and is this the time? within their investors that it's in a big time and it's going to okay. be 
going down right. and there's no more room for going up. Okay, so is, is this, is, okay, I think I got it. Thank you so much. Is this a case in terms of real estate prices up, 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 and it's sort of peaking? Or do you see, in your opinion, that real estate is going to continue to go? Is this the time to get in or is this the time to wait for it to drop? Right. Very hard for me to answer that. I think sort of like the election cycle, there are a lot of experts out there. Uh, I would never have thought that real estate would have continued to climb the way it has. I would have gotten out a couple of years ago already, but obviously I chose wrong because it keeps going up. I think it's very hard to, to answer that question right now. Okay, so let's just end with the following, and we'd be remiss without talking about ethics in the workplace. And what role do you believe that a person plays in terms ethically and also as a firm person? And how important is holding yourselves to a high moral standard, conducting yourself as an exemplary, uh, you know, sterling example of, of human nature and being somebody who really tries to go above and beyond to do what's right? So I think it's critical, first of all, as a firm person, it's very critical. But I think the real challenge for our community is that we have to inculcate these ethics in our children from a very young age. And what made me realize this is that, unfortunately, today schools aren't teaching that, and then we have troubles in the community. We were on a vacation once, a good number of years ago, we went on a cruise and we ended up in Turkey in one of these local markets. And my kids were amazed. Uh, Look, Abba, there's Gucci, there's Prada, there's this, there's that. And I explained to them that none of those things were real. And maybe I'm particularly sensitive to it because I am a lawyer and I work for a brand because uh, Donald also... They were, they were knockoffs. They were, they were knockoffs, knockoffs, they were knockoffs right. right. Donald is a strong brand, so I wouldn't let them buy anything. And they understood it. Uh, and I, had, I think that's really how our website, Inspire Conversation, got started. I asked one of my older kids to write an article about it, about why one shouldn't buy knockoffs. And that, just by pure coincidence, on that same cruise, we had gotten friendly with a travel agent from Europe who came to tell us that El Al was selling tickets from North America to Israel for, I don't remember that, some ridiculously cheap price, two, two fifty, something crazy like that. What I didn't know was that there was some computer glitch that caused those ticket prices right. to be right. that low. Right. And I'm not a rub, so I'm not poskening, and I can't, uh, I can't tell you that people shouldn't have bought it. But we had a very long conversation in my family over dinner that night on the cruise as to whether or not it's appropriate to buy those tickets or not appropriate. And I know all the arguments, there's insurance coverage, <laughs> well, they led me to believe that it was this price, lots of good arguments. At the end of the day, you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, should I take advantage of this? What kind of person I am? So we try very hard to have these discussions with our kids. I think that parents ought to have these discussions with the kids so that when they get to the workplace, they do think deeply about how they act and what they do. So I'm not sure if I'm directly answering the question, but I think it is so critical. And especially, you know, we want to hold ourselves out to be a certain type of person. We have to do it not only at home, we have to do it in the workplace as well. Beautiful, beautiful. I always encourage people when they're going for a job or they're conducting themselves in business or they want business, be a mensch. Midos is so important when you come across genuinely so as a respectful, responsible person. People just respond to that. I agree, 100%. Big difference, okay. We'd like to thank you so much for giving of your time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.